Victoria's Secret. The obsession with models in the early 2000s. The ideal body type that everybody strived for. Following the diets of these angels to achieve a perfect ideal body. And for society to evolve what the ideal for a woman should look like, but actually for the attraction of men. Here is a trigger warning, and this topic involves a lot of sexual harassment, traumatic experiences, body image, and eating disorders, and it may affect your mental well being. I'm going to briefly talk about the history because I know it's very well broadcasted online, and all of the things that I say in this video is alleged, not completely rooted in truth or facts. It's just my opinion, even though my opinion may be very strong. So Victoria's Secret was founded in 1977 by the American businessman Roy Raymond, who fundamentally started his business because of the uncomfortable experience he had when shopping for underwear for his wife. He saw a gap in the market and opened up Victoria's Secret as a place where men can comfortably shop for lingerie. The name Victoria resembling a high socialite, wearing luxury and secrets being the undergarment. Although he was really successful, the brand was actually on the brink of bankruptcy and that is where Les Wex stepped in from L Brands and he bought the company for $1 million. And that is where he quickly changed the business that is catered towards men, but actually shifted it to women. And in his work, by 1990, he made Victoria's Secret the biggest lingerie retailer in the US. In 1995, the annual fashion show was run by Ed Razor, and that became a huge hit in the 1999 when it was aired for the first time up to the point where it crashed the website. The Victoria's Secret fashion show was a huge hit and continued on with more and more extravagant shows. And around 1997, the Victoria's Secret angel came in and kick-started the modeling career of many high fashion supermodels. And over time, more and more high profile models, performers from the likes of the Hadid sisters, Kendall Jenner, Taylor Swift, Bruno Mars, Harry Styles, and Ariana Grande brought more popularity to the show. Also incredibly hyped up, full of glitz and glamour, filled with so much magic up until 2018 and that was where things started to turn. So what's the bad math after it all? I'm not gonna lie but I think the newer generation, thank goodness, didn't go through the skinny era trend that was happening in the early 2000s. There's a lot of other different trends happening which are also equally just as damaging like the cry girl trend, the BBLs, the slim thick trend. So they do have a lot of other problems too. But personally growing up in this era, it was so normal to be fat shamed. And if your body didn't look model like, and the Victoria's Secret body was kind of seen as the epitome of I guess the ideals, the best version of yourself and the best fitness and you were literally idolized for looking like them. But in reality, it really wasn't that beautiful. The requirements for the fashion show was really, really tough. So you had to be five or eight inches tall, 34 inch bust, 24 inch waist, 34 inch hips but then the number started to become even smaller at 32 inch bust, 23 waist, 32 hips and the focus age range was around 18 years old and no older than 22 years old and the usual facial features involved a small nose, full lips, high cheekbones and a very chiseled face and the diets revolving around the models they were a huge highlight amongst magazines, YouTube channels, diet forum and the talk of the town always revolved around how the Victoria's Secret models prepared for the show and how they were able to achieve such bodies. And that's where the ideals of this whole era was really, really brainwashingly narrow. And this included campaigns that clearly stated what the definition of the ideal beauty was. And that is where they had the campaign described as the perfect body, where the models had a similar body type and they were paler toned and they really looked similar, really narrowing down what it meant to be beautiful. And the Victoria's Secret models themselves, they would be posting on YouTube, on TV, what it is like to prepare for their Victoria's Secret fashion show, what it's like to achieve their bodies, what they eat, what they do for exercise, 
And all I have to say is it's really intense. And they literally work out every minute of the day because that is their job to do so. And where it started to turn sour on the online platforms like YouTube is that it ended up becoming a trend on YouTube to try these diets, try these exercise routines. And that is where they saw huge results in dropping so much weight in such a short period of time. But at the same time, aside from looking more like the Victoria's Secret models, it also left a lot of people feeling really miserable. I'm so hungry deprived of their mental capacity. They started feeling brain fogginess, weakness in the body, a lot of health problems too. This diet is absolutely terrible and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemies. I'm so effing hungry. Basically drained out of all your resources. And the damage was done even further with the next door neighbor brand, Pink, which was aimed at towards younger children and younger teens. And that is where they over centralized. Bit of a lighter term than what I'd usually say. But it was advertised all over the show, but also in what they wrote on their underwear. So how were they able to get away with this? In a nutshell, they didn't, but how so many were influenced by this trend simply is through marketing. They were glamorous. The busy backstage area was really fun to see. And as a teenager, it was really easy to be swayed by all of this and wanting to have this fabulous, glamorous life. And at the same time, it wasn't just Victoria's Secret having this whole skinny trend era. It was a whole era in itself. And it was something that to be skinny, it was to be praised for. And I still remember as a teenager, I wasn't necessarily fat, but I was a little bit chubby. And I would definitely want to cherish those moments again because it's that baby youthful glow that you can never ever get back. But I remember very vividly that I was shamed for being a little chubbier than a Victoria's Secret model. And the commentary around my weight was just making me feel really, really self-conscious. Because it was also deemed as something that you're being lazy, you're just not doing enough, you're eating too much. And I personally got affected by this because A, it's the age that I was in, I was a young teenager. And that is where I just ended up eating way too little, became horrifically underweight. And it was a really, really dark phase in my health because I literally lost my period. I was feeling weak. I had heart palpitations. And sometimes I actually feared going to sleep because I didn't know when I was going to wake up simply because I just wasn't having enough energy. And then there was just one morning where I had kind of an epiphany where I knew that I just had to eat just to live because I knew I couldn't sustain this any longer and I knew this was detrimental to my health. I knew that I may not wake up one morning just to sustain this lifestyle. I knew that I can't do this if I want to have kids. Like, there's no way that I can sustain this lifestyle and how is this the epitome of health? And all I thought to do to heal was really simple because most of the health talk back then on, on YouTube, which was what I had at the time or in magazines, were all about dieting and eating less. So all I focused on was just having my three meals a day, what was available to me. And I had to just build my appetite again and my stomach just shrunk really, really tiny and I had to somehow stretch it out a little bit again. So so three meals was a lot for me at the time, even if it was three small meals. And over time, I just gently built it more and more. And for the first year, especially in the first six months, I ballooned. I gained a lot of weight, not to the huge levels where I became overweight. I was actually in the healthy range. And from that point, I still kept eating my three meals. That was my golden rule. And that is where I was able to have the energy to start doing some running. I started to enjoy more socials. I was able to go out a bit more because I had the energy to do so. Whereas before I would be so exhausted. So I did balloon, I did gain a lot of weight and then I got chubby, but then it stopped at around that six months phase. But then after a while, it started to just taper down where my weight just slowly lifted off. And I think that was when my body just started to realize that I'm not in starvation mode and that my body can be trusted again, that I will be fed, there will be a meal next. And that is where I had a lot of time to heal and I had a lot of support around me. And so it takes time for people to heal and mine it may be long to some, but it may be quick to others, but your body is at a different rate 
to anyone else and you shouldn't be comparing what my journey is or anyone's journey on their healing process to know when their body will be back at equilibrium. So whether it takes months, whether it takes years, I think mentally for me it took me two to three years and time is mainly the way to heal and as more and more people were opening up speaking about their mental health and about their body image especially the struggles with eating disorders and especially their mental thoughts about their body size it became apparent that we were all going through the same thing we're not alone we all have basically deprived bodies and that we're all actually just brainwashed by the media to think that this is an ideal body type that we need and that is the epitome of fitness and that is where during this time when everybody was coming out talking about their mental health a lot of the models were coming out as well and talking about their mental health in the modeling industry and that it wasn't so glitz and glamorous as they were showing on tv this is bridget and she was i think she was mostly famous for modeling for pink and that is where she came out with a lot of horror stories on what it's like to be a victoria's secret model i had an eating disorder i was relying on anti-anxiety medication i was having panic attacks constantly Constantly, I was exhausted. My body was malnourished, my mind was malnourished, and I just, it was relentless. What that company represented for me and for so many other women was extremely exploitative at that time. You know, it can, it, to me, it felt like controlling women, getting women as small as possible, and then even not being small enough. And then we have Adriana Lima, who was the OG when it comes to Victoria's Secret Angels, where she was there from the very early stages of her career in Victoria's Secret. She went through all the way to, I think, 2018. And even her, as one of the top models in this industry, she had so much pressure going up after her. And especially she had been pregnant, gave birth, and even after that, she still had to do so much exercise to be thin again. And the amount that she had to do where she just cut out all solid food for nine days and even 12 hours before the show she cut out all liquids to really just dehydrate her body and that is just simply purely unhealthy even if it is just doing it once a year once is already too much damage but from victoria's secret models sharing their stories and sharing their insight to what it's really like being a victoria's secret model and the dark side of their eating disorders how they are treated more models are coming out with similar stories when i started modeling i was like a 38 hip which is like a lot bigger than what i am now i'm like a 35 now which is not like huge but in modeling it's like huge I'm a model. 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 And it wasn't just the Victoria's Secret fashion industry. It's a lot wider than that too, but Victoria's Secret is quite heavily bad in quite a lot of ways too. So a lot of models were coming out to sharing that it isn't so glitz and glamorous. It isn't as beautiful as it seems. And it's actually something that's very, very detrimental for your health. And in an interview with Vogue, with Ed Razor, who was involved in organizing the whole show, they had a talk about inclusivity and it shocked so many people. Razor said, everybody keeps talking about the Rihanna show. If we had done Rihanna show, we would be accused of pandering without question. Vogue says, pandering, why? Razak said, because the brand has a specific image, has a point of view, has a history. By the way, we've had three pregnant models walk the show. Everybody had the conversation about Savage X Fenty having the pregnant model in the show. We watched this, we're amused by it, but we don't milk it. And all of these things that they've invented, we've done and continue to do so. And another thing about plus size inclusion, Ed Razak said, if you're asking if we've considered putting a transgender model in the show or looked at putting a plus size model in the show, we have. We invented the plus size model show in what was a sister division, Lane Bryant. Lane Bryant still sells plus size lingerie, but still sells a specific range, just like every specialty retailer in the world sells a range of clothing. As do we. We market to who we sell to and we don't market to the whole world. So it wasn't just the body image that was bad about Victoria's Secret. It was actually more than that and it's much, much darker. And it was about how the models were being treated. Victoria's Secret owner Les Wexner had a best friend called Jeffrey Epstein. And Jeffrey Epstein used his connection with Les Wexner in a horrific and 
oh so wrongly unforgivable way Epstein set up a scam where he was posing as one to audition and to hire some Victoria's Secret models for the show but at a catch because it was at his mansion and that is where he allegedly assaulted them Actress Alicia Arden spoke up about this where she was victimized to Epstein's horrific behavior. I just came out of the um, hotel for meeting Jeffrey. I didn't expect that I had to be in a bra and underwear in front of him in the hotel room and, and then he was touching my butt and then he got actually a little mad that I put two hats in, you know, in my bra. So I took it. Clearly he touched you and you sound frantic in this recording. I was. I was putting my skirt down and my top down and my skirt and I wanted him to stop that. And he started touching my hips and my buttocks and, and, and telling me that he wanted to manhandle me. He said the word manhandle twice. I've never heard that word out of anyone else's mouth. A week later and filed this report for actual battery. In the police report, you described his hands as weapons. I did. Alicia says police never followed up. Why didn't the police officer say something about him, have him followed or investigate him? Maybe it could have saved these underage girls. Police tell Inside Edition they did follow up, interviewing both Ms. Arden and Jeffrey Epstein, but they say Ms. Arden didn't want to pursue criminal charges. And she disputes that. And one model says, I spent all my savings getting Victoria's Secret lingerie to prepare for what I thought would be my addition, but instead it seemed like a casting call for prostitution, and I felt like I was in hell. And whilst this was all happening, Ed Razak was adding more fuel to the fire, and he would shame models for eating. Ed physically stepped in front of me and stopped me from going up to the buffet. And the first thing he said was like, he was like, do you really think you need more bread? Like, are you really going to eat more food? And so I kind of, I just froze up. I stood there. He kept going on, like, um, you know, like, how do you look at yourself in the mirror when you leave your house in the morning? How are you okay with the way you look? So I put down my plate, went straight to the bathroom where I had this, like, really just, like, shaky kind of shock. Tears, just, like, being, like, what? what even just happened he would also allegedly take advantage of the models you know i rem i remember being on set with him and his assistant and his assistant made this joke that made me feel really awkward and it was like she was like if i had a dollar for the amount of sexual harassment complaints that came across my desk like i'd be rich and it was like they both laughed and i kind of was like well that doesn't feel good <laughs> And then this article by the New York Times says, Ed Razak, for decades one of the top executives of L Brands, parent company of Victoria's Secret, was the subject of repeated complaints about inappropriate conduct. He tried to kiss the models and asked them to sit on his lap, and he touched one's crotch ahead of the 2018 Victoria's Secret fashion show. That is horrific. And in 2001, actor Rupert Everett hosted the show, but the commentary on the female body was just disgusting this is what happened and i'm very grossed out about this this is the moment to accidentally lock your wives or girlfriends in the attic because we are going to take a virtual tour of heidi klum's body you guys <laughs> i'm standing here with heidi's legs and let me tell you they smell delicious they are as smooth as alabaster and actually for example if i rub my cheek up and down her leg it's like oh god it's like it's like the meeting between a pashmina and a chartouche, and as I kiss my way up her legs, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking. What am I thinking? <gasps> Don't worry, Heidi, I've got my tweezers in my makeup bag. <laughs> in my mind right now, I cannot fathom how we managed to get here how we got here in the first place and why there are so many horrific acts out there and I just cannot understand why there are some humans that act this way and bear in mind back then there was no YouTube there was no real user-generated content that was big and mainstream it was just mainstream TV it was just magazines and that's all the information that we had back then and I question how Ed Razak and Jeffrey Epstein ended up thinking in such ways. 
So I did a little bit of digging on their backgrounds and I'm only going to go through Jeffrey Epstein today because this video is going to get crazy, crazy long and it already is. And Jeffrey Epstein was raised by Jewish parents in New York City and that is where he was actually very smart in school. He skipped two grades in high school and he went to university but he didn't finish his university course and then he went on to his first job which was teaching but he didn't actually have the qualifications to teaching so somehow he may have slipped the talk and managed to convince a connection to happen and then made his way to have a job in teaching. And this is where the article in the New York Times says Jeffrey Epstein taught at Dalton and his behavior was noticed. And it says that some students at the esteemed Manhattan prep school recall that Mr. Epstein now charged with trafficking was willing to violate norms in his encounters with girls and in this article it says that there was a mild sense of creepiness and that it was a kind of general circle of girls and he was much more present amongst the students specifically the girl students during non-teaching hours it seemed just it was kind of inappropriate and there was a little bit more digging. Jeffrey Epstein had a girlfriend at the time called Ghislaine and Ghislaine was actually part of the history and enabled Jeffrey Epstein of this behavior which I just cannot fathom. In an interview with Vanity Fair she said to them, Jeffrey always wanted to give the impression that he was an international man of mystery. I control everyone and everything. I collect people, I own people, I damage people. And this to me looks like a huge hunger for power, for control and probably money too. And in the same article, it says multiple victims claim she was both part of the trafficking ring, often bringing girls to Epstein and a sexual participant. And that is where his and her ideal of power and control just became overgrowing, over crazy. And they even managed to film Prince Andrew as a method of insurance to be used as blackmail because they want to seek that power and control. So I want to share with you something and this is called the Duluth Circle. It's a highlight of common ways of where power and control can happen and for all the wrong reasons. And this was created in 1984 by the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project and it was originally tackling the problem of men battering victims in domestic violence. But it can also be applied in work environments, public settings as well as relationships. It's particularly helpful for when you are going through a situation yourself where someone could be dominating you, using you as a form of power and control and you may not realize it because you're stuck in it and once you're stuck in a submission setting it kind of stirs your mind to be a little bit hazy and you can't really think straight. So having this circle is kind of really helpful to identify whether you are in one even if you're a little bit unsure. And I have to say this has helped me in a lot of different relationship problems and particularly my previous one where I can share with you an upcoming series about relationships and how your mind and changes and alters as you go through one. Whether you are in a vicious cycle with someone who is hungry for power and control in many different aspects. But here I hope you can identify whether you're in one and whether you need to seek for help and it just gives you a chance to think about whether you need some troubleshooting help in your relationships. And if you are stuck and you need some troubleshooting help and you don't know where to go, I will link some links down below. There will be sources to ask for help, ask for some resources, and they will be able to help you out. So just to end this episode in maybe such an unfortunate event, I want to quickly mention about the rebranding of Victoria's Secret as of, I think it was early last year. This is where they replace the Victoria's Secret Angels with the VS Collective, where this includes a lot of famous actors, inspirational speakers, public speakers, and athletes to really push a new light for their branding and shed a new light for the message they want to share with the world. But can this be enough to shift the horrific history that Victoria's Secret had? All I can say for now is that a lot of this craziness that happened, they have moved and pushed it away and I'm glad they did so. But I think for the rest of us and for everyone involved, 
time is still there and needed to heal. So I don't expect huge drastic changes. I don't expect anything to happen overnight, but at least in my mind, this is already a good step forward to making a better foundation for the future. And most importantly, to let people heal. So I hope this video was insightful. And if you wanna see more content about being mindful and learning about your brain and how the mind works, then click over here and I will see you there. Bye.